Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Chris Crow. Chris is head of economic and flow research at Capula Investment Management, a London-based hedge fund where he covers global economics, primarily the G10 countries plus China. He was previously UK economist at Barclays for two years and prior to that worked at the International Monetary Fund for five years. He has also published in top economic journals. Chris joins us today to give us a perspective of a macro economist from inside a hedge fund on markets, Brexit, and other current events, as well as some of his own research. Chris, welcome to the show. Hi, David. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to have you on. And I have to give a disclaimer for you. you your views represent yours alone and not your firm or any entity related to your firm. So this is Chris talking. And I have to give a second disclaimer that we are two-time co-authors. So we've written together. So I am bringing on a a friend of the show and a co-author. So Chris, tell us, how did you get into macroeconomics? So uh, I guess I was drawn to economics uh, kind of indirectly in the sense that I was always, as a child, I was always interested in politics. And I kind of felt like uh, you had to understand economics to understand uh, politics and policy and kind of constraints on on what you could do politically. Um, and I guess I was also good at uh, subjects like history at, at school, but also good at physics. And so I kind of felt like if there was one subject which would allow me to kind of combine the two, kind of looking at um, society, but also um, using Qualitative, quantitative uh, skills uh, and uh, techniques that the economics would offer me that opportunity. But it was a bit of a kind of gamble because I didn't study economics uh, at, a, at high school. Um, but I enjoyed studying it at university. And um, the macro side was the one that appealed to me most. It was seemed most relevant to the to the real world, um, most kind of related to those kind of politi- political and kind of policy issues that I was interested in when I was younger. I mean, in the UK as well, in the sort of, in the 1990s, uh, you know, there was a lot of, there was a lot going on in terms of macroeconomics. We had a number of different efforts at putting together a kind of credible monetary policy regime, most of which um, ended in ignominious failure until sort of the uh, early, mid 90s, um, when the, we had a new regime of central bank independence, the Bank of England, which kind of turned things around. But prior to that, we'd uh, made an effort at shadowing um, the uh, Deutsche Mark in the late 1980s and then late 80s, early 90s, a failed effort to join the exchange rate mechanism, which was a kind of uh, early precursor of the euro. Um, and like many of our um Excapades with the European Union didn't go so well. We'll, t- we'll talk about Brexit later, I think. Um, so there, there was kind of lots going on from a macro point of view in the UK, and sort of lots of interesting issues. And so I think I was drawn to drawn to the subject for that reason. So Chris, you were probably just a kid during this time, but the early '90s, when the UK broke free from the exchange rate mechanism, or it had been tied previously to the Bundesbank, as you mentioned, was that a, a formidable experience for you in, in getting you interested in macroeconomics? Very much so, yeah. I mean, break free is a kind of slightly euphemistic term. It was a more of a kind of ignominious uh, okay. exit. The, U- the UK very much wanted to stay in the ERM, and the, the Bank of England, uh, exp- you know, uh, spent quite a large proportion of their reserves trying to stay in. Uh, I think the bank felt. Uh, with maybe not as much support from the Bundesbank and uh, the rest of the Europeans as they might have uh, received. Um, But yeah, it was was a very formative uh, experience. Um, At the time, it was sort of seen as a total disaster. It was called Black Wednesday. um, And uh, it it eventually cost the job of the Chancellor of the Exchequer and arguably probably um, was the final nail in the coffin for the uh, conservative government at the time. But uh, it was certainly a formative event um, in terms of my sort of economics uh, education and sort of becoming interested in the subject. It was such a huge uh, deal at the time. And um, it was it was interesting because, as I say, although it was viewed as a disaster at the time, actually it kicked off um, one of the uh, best periods of uh, economic 
uh, growth um, to the general economic outlook in the UK, arguably for, for, for a generation. Um, we had a period of relatively strong growth. Uh, inflation didn't take off as many people had feared when the pound exited uh, the ERM. So it, it was a kind of interesting experience. And I think it was it, certainly for me, it drew me towards the subject. I think it was also kind of an important issue for UK policymakers as well and framed much of the debate on issues like the euro um, that followed. Yeah. So was this experience important in the UK not joining the euro? Absolutely, I think, yes. I mean, I think there are two elements uh, to um, the UK's decision not to join the euro. One was purely political uh, and reflects the fact, you know, as we've seen from Brexit, that there's always been a fairly substantial proportion of the UK population who were not really into Europe, um, to put it mildly. And uh, the euro was seen as a sort of typical European kind of grand projet, you know, a kind of... Uh, project, sort of French style project of trying to achieve too much through political diktat and not a sort of British type product of a kind of gradualist reform uh, and kind of incrementalism. You know, that's a sort of a bit of a cliche, but that's sort of how I think how the British view the Europe, the Europeans, you know, that they have a tendency to go in for these big projects. So there's always been a certain degree of skepticism about the euro uh, in the UK, uh, but then coupled to it, the, the experience of the ERM, uh, was that you know the UK would do much better with a floating exchange rate, that our economy, although close to Europe, wasn't sufficiently in sync with the economies of continental Europe to make the euro a sustainable proposition for us. You know, I think other countries in Europe kind of took the opposite uh, lesson, which was that a system of pegged exchange rates wasn't a hard enough arrangement that you know, the markets could always, with sufficient uh, firepower, could always push you off that fixed exchange rate. And the only way to really achieve um, that stability was to have a single currency. So I think, you know, it's it's interesting that the two, Europe, you know, UK and the con continental Europe took very two very different lessons uh, from the uh, experience. And in my view, the past decade has vindicated the UK view. <laughs> that would be my takeaway. But uh, in yeah, I think I, I think that's probably right. Yeah, uh, the the euros, you know, created problems for countries like Italy, which is sort of not quite as semi-detached as the UK is, but it is in a similar kind of um, a similar kind of position, you know, where where uh, the economy ha isn't quite as strong as the economies of, of uh, France and, and particularly Germany. And uh, the country has, you know, relied on exchange rate flexibility, uh, which is often a euphemism for kind of devaluing your exchange rate to gain competitiveness and uh, achieve growth. And obviously, inside the euro, it's much harder to achieve that. You know, you have to uh, undergo quite difficult processes of what you call internal devaluation. In other words, yep. uh, reducing wages and prices without the kind of slightly easier uh, way of doing it, which is just to allow your exchange rate to devalue. Yes, very interesting, these experiences. So they're formative for you. They help put the UK on a better path, arguably. Um, but, but going back to you, so you got into macroeconomics. You're now at a hedge fund, but you've worked at the IMF. You've published in some good journals. Um, you've written on central bank independence. And I thought it's just worth mentioning that macroeconomists do have lives outside of macroeconomics. You're also an actor and a writer in theater. Is that right? Yeah, very much an amateur one. I've been working on, okay. a, on a project. This but it's, that's, that's so fascinating. You know, you, we have a macroeconomist who also has his hands in acting. And I'll just mention also for our listeners' sake, so you know a little bit more about myself as well as Chris. We're co-authors. We'll talk about some of our work later in the show. But we both met in, in a very strange way. We, we were both dabbling in the economics of religion. So I was looking at the relationship between um, the business cycle of religiosity. And explain what you briefly what you were working on at the IMF at the time that also kind of put you in that camp. Yeah, so I was, uh, I was working on a, a slightly um, strange paper uh, looking at uh, whether – people's religious uh, views, um, and in particular views on um, the uh, the end of the world, which is, from a European perspective, is a surprisingly sort of prevalent sort of philosophy in, in the US, um, uh, and whether that impacts people's uh, 
uh, behavior and uh, try to focus on like local housing markets uh, of to sort to, um, to to get an insight into that issue. Yeah, it was a slightly, it was a slightly strange paper. I'm not sure whether it really holds up, but um, the, the, the actually the empirical results were quite strong. But uh, that's often the way with empirics. Uh, you might find an interesting correlation, but then sort of struggle to to fully motivate it. Yeah, no, it was it was, it was fun work. We we both were kind of you know involved in this economics of religion at an interesting yeah. time, right around yeah. two thousand eight. So there's interest in it, and that's how we met. We, we yeah, co-authored I, several papers that way. Yeah, I mean, I to me as you know, as an economist, I've always been found the kind of um, homo economicus kind of view of uh, human nature a little bit limiting. You know, I've always wanted to try and get beyond that. And, you know, there's been quite a lot of interesting work on you know, behavioral economics, looking at people's motivations and trying to look beyond the kind of utility maximization view, which is quite limiting, I think. So, I, you know, I, I'll make no apology for sort of dabbling in this slightly strange esoteric kind of uh, areas. And unfortunately, I don't get much time to do that sort of stuff now. Yeah, yeah. But it was fun to dabble at the time, for sure. But uh, Definitely. And I, it gave us a, it gave us the opportunity to meet as well. That's so absolutely it was, right. Uh, it was it was opportune. Yes, it was. So let's let's move on and talk about your day job. So you work at a hedge fund. We've had many guests on the show who are academics. Maybe they work at central banks. We've had a few market practitioners, but I think mm-hmm. you're the first person who's worked at a hedge fund we've had on the show. So it's interesting to, to get your perspective on what it's like. So what is a typical day like in your world? What do you do? How do you process news and information? You know, how important are all these market developments? So walk us through all of that. Yeah, so as an economist, you know, and I think I think the role of economist tends to vary very much by firm, uh, depending on the focus of the firm and what ex- exactly it is they want to get out of you. For me, um, you know, my job is really to act as a kind of filter for information. Uh, through to risk takers. Uh, so to follow the data, follow policy announcements, uh, and to um, kind of pick out what's relevant, what, you know, what the key themes are, what the, you know, some of the implications for markets and feed those through to my colleagues. Um, you know, and you're doing it across different time zones. You know, my, my role is very much a kind of global one. One of the benefits of sitting in London is your ability to follow events uh, you know right across the world you know we get the end of the trading day in asia we get obviously the european trading hours and you get um at least the morning of uh, the u.s markets as well some of my colleagues in london actually follow the u.s markets throughout the the day in the uh, u.s um uh, eastern time zone um you know so i have an ability really to 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 follow those numbers and uh, policy developments you know following key policy makers uh, the ecb the fed uh, BOJ, Bank of England, um, you know, understanding central banks, translating some of, um, you know, how central bankers think and translating um, their message to uh, market participants is quite often um, a bit of a divergence between how central bankers communicate and the kind of timelines that central bankers um, work on and uh, how people in the markets think. People in the markets tend to expect things to happen much more quickly. They assume that the central bank's primary focus in their communications is with market participants, whereas often uh, central banks view their primary role as um, communicating with the public at large. So it's things like that, you know, just acting as a kind of bridge uh, between policymakers and uh, people uh, trading in the markets and also, um, you know, following the data because people in the markets tend to be very numerate, very intelligent people, but uh, they may not have the economic Knowledge to understand quite what this number means. You know why? Why does this number going up mean mean X, Y, or Z? So it's, a, it's sort of acting like a bridge or a filter of information, if you like. Okay. Well, let's move on from what you do as a practitioner at the hedge fund and how you incorporate market data, how you incorporate what the Fed is saying, to an issue really close to home for you, and that's Brexit. So you are in London, yes. as you mentioned. And you have actually worked on this topic. Yes, we live, live and breathe Brexit. <laughs> yes. Indeed. So you, it's on the point, unfortunately. Uh, everyone wants to know about Brexit, and it's it's kind of at the top of the news sort of every day. I mean, Brexit fatigue is, um, is uh, happening in this country now, or probably has been for a while. Yeah, well, tell us about it. I mean, what, what, is it, what do you see happening in the UK with Brexit um, on a practical level, just you know, as, as a UK resident, but then maybe also bring it back home to finance industry in general. 
Um, you know, because <laughs> one of the things you hear is that London is this great financial capital, but Brexit might do that industry harm. In, in fact, there's, you, know, you see these articles, anecdotal, I think, at this point, but, you know, some firms are moving offices, you know, to Europe as opposed to keeping them in London. So maybe first tell us the, the general lay of the land, what's going to happen, sure. what you see happening, and then maybe veer into the effects for financial industry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, maybe it'd be helpful just to very briefly give a kind of timeline sure. of what's been happening with Brexit, because perhaps, perhaps some of your listeners, particularly in um, in the US, maybe aren't quite as in the weeds on this issue as we unfortunately have to be. Um, but, you know, we had this vote on uh, in June 2016, uh, where we narrowly voted to leave the EU by a margin of uh, 52% to 48%. Um, in March 2017, um, the government uh, triggered um, what's called Article 50. This is an article of the uh, Lisbon Treaty, the EU Treaty, which um, is the art- it sort of provides the rules for how you leave the EU. And essentially, because you were it, it, um, triggering that article, um, starts the clock uh, ticking on two years. So we were due to leave the EU on March 29th, um, uh, 2019, this year. Um, the UK and the EU negotiated what was called a withdrawal agreement, which uh, um, essentially covered three issues. One of one was um, sort of maintaining the rights of EU and UK citizens living in the other territory um, currently. What the other was um, that the UK would sort of pay its outstanding bills, which uh, amount to about um, a little bit below fifty uh, billion dollars current exchange rates. And the third and most contentious part dealt with the issue of the uh, border on the island of Ireland between Northern Ireland, which is part of the UK, and and the Republic of Ireland. Um, That was a big sticking point, uh, the way that the the issue was dealt with. A lot of um, MPs, particularly on the conservative side and the government side, felt that there were too many concessions to the EU. Um, And as a result, um, the Prime Minister, Theresa May, tried three times to get that uh, withdrawal agreement passed in, in the UK Parliament and failed three times. The first time it was actually the biggest ever defeat that government has ever um, suffered in the House of Commons. So pretty comprehensive defeat for her approach, which is why she's currently on her way out. Um, uh, Brexit, As a result, Brexit was delayed until the 31st of October. Um, and we're likely to get uh, her, Theresa May's successor, elected in about, um, about a week's time. They're currently going for a kind of internal party ballot um, the likely successor, who's called Boris Johnson, has promised that we will leave whatever it takes on on the 31st of October, even if that means leaving without a deal. Um, the question being whether, A, he would actually do it. A lot of people have big fears about what that would involve. Um, and also whether he'd be allowed to do it in the sense that the parliament will try and insert itself into that process. And there's a decent chance we have a general election uh, in the fall. Um, in terms of a sort of what, what Brexit might involve, both broadly and and, um, for the financial sector, I mean, maybe talk about finance uh, to start with. Sure. Um, obviously, the UK has a huge uh, financial sector. It's extremely large, extremely successful relative to the size um, of, of the country. Um, the e- expectations are that, that we could potentially see a number of jobs in the banking sector go. There was an FT um, a piece of an analysis by the Financial Times that estimates that um, we may have lost about one or be in the process of losing about uh, one and a half thousand um, jobs in the banking sector directly thanks to uh, Brexit. That is small relative to the size of the banking sector, but also small relative to, I think, what people were expecting uh, beforehand. Um, I think a, a piece, prior piece of analysis uh, by the FT a couple of years ago suggested we might have expected about three times that amount of job losses in the banking sector. So so direct impact so far has been perhaps smaller than expected. Um, you know, there are issues going forward for, for, for finance um, if Brexit happens, particularly if we get uh, a Brexit uh, without a deal. The issue be there being that if we're you know, under the withdrawal agreement, if that had been passed, uh, there would have been what was called a transition period, which would have essentially kept current EU rules uh, in place and allowed a kind of a soft transition uh, rather than a kind of overnight closing down of, of um, existing arrangements. Um, you know, in, fin- in, the financial sec- in the financial sector, we've had an, uh, un- under the EU rules, you have a process called passporting, which essentially allows um, provide service providers in one country to sell financial services in other countries within the EU as long as they're regulated uh, in their home country. So outside 
of the EU, we'd have to rely on a process called equivalence, which uh, provides much more limited um, ability to uh, provide services cross-border. Now, for different parts of um, the UK financial sector, that'll be a big issue or a small issue, depending on whether they're primarily focused on um, the EU market or more globally. And large parts of the financial sector are much more globally focused. So, um, you know, the impact will be... Um, uh, will be significant, I think, but it's not sort of the end of the world for, um, for the financial sector by any means. And it probably, you know, some other opportunities uh, may be opened uh, up in the process. For other sectors of the economy, I think Brexit is perhaps more uh, of a worry. Um, areas like the auto sector, for instance, or other parts of manufacturing, which are highly dependent on just-in-time um, kind of production methods, you know, you have car parts which cross borders multiple times. Um, if, you know, they're faced long delays at the border, which is probably likely in the case of a no deal Brexit, um, you know, for checking uh, product standards, for potentially imposing tariffs, um, you know, this will uh, materially impact the ability of those firms uh, to do business. I think the auto sector is, is extremely worried. Um, and agricultural sector too faces uh, big challenges, you know, large, um, it's, it's a big export area uh, for the UK into Europe. And, um, you know, food, obviously, fresh food has big implications if it's kept waiting at the border uh, for long periods of time. So, you know, the, the impact on the UK economy will be material. Um, you know, my expectation would be that in the event of a no deal Brexit, we'll probably end up in recession. Um, yeah, it's not certain, um, but it seems very plausible to me. Certainly already you can see a decline in business investment. You know, we've gone from a situation where uh, the UK business investment was um, amongst the highest um, growth rates in, in, in the G7 to where it's now the lowest. Uh, so it's clearly been an impact on uh, business investment. Um, and in general, you know, business surveys show a gradual deterioration in business sentiment. Um, economic growth has slowed, even though we haven't actually left. Um, you know, initially, uh, growth held up quite well after we after the Brexit vote, um, but over time uh, it's fallen back. You know, and it's um, currently, um, the, you know, GDP is more or less at the at the level uh, that the Bank of England predicted in the immediate aftermath of, of the Brexit vote. Uh, initially, it kind of outperformed, but over time it slipped back, and it's now kind of at that level, which was materially lower than the Bank of England had forecast just prior to the vote. So you can see that I think there certainly has been an impact on the economy. Um, you know, the exchange rate devalued um, uh, uh, fairly sharply in the initial aftermath of the vote. It, de it devalued again subsequently once um, the uh, it, it appeared clear that the UK was going to follow a relatively sort of hard uh, Brexit. Uh, since then, it's kind of gone on a bit of a roller coaster. Initially, people hoped with the withdrawal agreement that we get this transition period and um, the economic impact would be softened. Uh, as those hopes have kind of evaporated somewhat, uh, the uh, exchange rate has, has started heading down again. And now, with um, the, the likely next prime minister apparently being willing to countenance uh, leaving without a deal, it seems to be impacting sterling again, sending it lower in the last few days. Given all these developments, Given, I think there's a growing awareness of the cost of Brexit, are there voters who now would vote differently? I mean, if, if do you think there's a lot of voter remorse about the votes that were made in 2016? There's a bit. There's a bit, yes. Um, there's not as much as perhaps you might have expected. Um, you know, the, the the sort of depressing thing about Brexit um, is that it's it's uh, opened the door to a kind of U U.S. style culture war in this country, um, which uh, in which you know positions become extremely entrenched, and uh, it becomes a, almost a matter of identity for people. Um, and so, we, you know, there has been something of a change in public opinion, and partly that just reflects demographics as well. You know, it may not be people changing their minds necessarily. But you know, the vote for Brexit was very heavily skewed towards uh, older people. And, um, you know, older people do have a tendency to die more than younger people. And younger people who couldn't vote um, in 2016 are now old enough to vote. So there's been a kind of natural evolution in views um, on just simply because of sort of passage of time. And there has been, I think, a limited number of people changing their mind. But it's not as much. As you'd think, you know, if we did have a second referendum on Brexit, my best guess is that it would probably be won by Remain this time around. Uh, but then I would have, you know, I expected Remain to win the last sure. uh, referendum. So, um, you know, I, I think it's by no means guaranteed.
Well, I wonder if you get to the point where you do leave the EU without a deal and you have this recession that you suggested may occur. I wonder if people will really begin to connect the dots. Brexit leads to lower you know, standard of living and, and really be remorseful and regret the vote they made. Maybe they need a little more pain. Well, it's, it's possible. It's a slightly depressing thought. Um, you know, I, th- I think that until it happens, the, the risk is people will just dismiss it. You know, um, yeah. they'll call it project. They'll call it project fear. Um, they'll say, you know, what, you know, economists might be predicting this, but economists are not necessarily very good at predicting things. So, Fair. you know, they'll believe it when they'll see it. And also, you've got to bear in mind a lot of people who voted for Brexit. You know, some of them lived in economically depressed places, um, perhaps had personally, um, you know, had, we're not in a great place economically. A lot of people felt like things would couldn't get much worse for them, and so even if the economy as a whole takes a hit, they won't be affected. A lot of older people, of course, you know, are retired, so um, you know, then it's not like they're going to lose their job. Yeah. Let me ask this question. So, if we let's say we do get to that point, so there's a there's a, a withdrawal from the EU. There's no arrangement, so you have this recession. Let's say it's a painful experience. Let's say people do change their minds in, in large numbers. So if they did a second referendum, it would it would be like overwhelming support for Remain. What could the what could the UK get after it has left the EU and, and it, it wants to come back in without a deal? I mean it, it, are, are, would it be would the UK be so far gone <laughs> that it would be hopeless to try to get back in at that point? Well, the, the issue is that the EU is uh, is uh, uh, based on uh, rules and and laws, and um, under the rules, uh, once you leave, you can't just rejoin um, on a kind of you know, sorry guys, I was wrong kind of okay. basis. You have to rejoin as an as a new member, and I think the EU would go out of its way to make that process as easy as possible for the UK. Um, you know, it would be the sort of return of the prodigal son uh, kind of situation, but um, they can't bend the rules completely. And so, for instance, the UK had negotiated a fairly generous financial arrangement with the EU um, where they would actually get a rebate on some of their membership fees and that, that would be gone. The UK had negotiated um, an exemption from the requirement to join the euro. And uh, if the UK joined as a new member, it would be under an obligation to join the euro, which, as we've already discussed, might uh, not be particularly uh, easy for the UK. So, um, you know, the issue is once you're out, getting back, Back in again doesn't provide you with all the goodies you necessarily had in the first place. You know, the UK was in a fairly good place with the EU before the, before the Brexit vote, actually, where we um, were outside of some of the stuff that we didn't uh, like about the EU, but um, benefited from the bits we did like. Um, a lot of people in the EU weren't particularly keen on that. Um, and, and indeed, you know, you can make the case that being a kind of semi-detached member of the EU is perhaps the reason why we end up leaving. You know, you, you should be either in or out. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as a country, we never quite embrace the EU as wholeheartedly as perhaps we should have done or as, as, we, as much as we um, should have done if we wanted to remain a member, perhaps. OK, so the next important deadline is when? So the, the big deadline is is October 31st. That's when okay. uh, we uh, are under obligation uh, to leave. We can request an extension. Um, the EU would probably only give us an extension at this stage if it was for a purpose, i.e. if we were going to have a general election to try and come up uh, with a different policy or perhaps in order to facilitate a second referendum. But just to give us another opportunity to um, kind of argue amongst ourselves, which is essentially what we've been doing since uh, 29th of <laughs> March, I think is, you know, it's, it's, it's not anyone's interest. It's probably not even in the UK's interests, ultimately. Um, so, you know, the 31st October is a big, big deadline. The question is, will we have a government in place who will actually would actually request an extension? Um, you know, under the current prime minister, will be in place for another week. Uh, you know, I think she sort of stared into the abyss and decided that for a number of reasons she wasn't willing to countenance uh, leaving without a deal. Um, now, the current front runner in to you know to replace her, Boris Johnson, has said quite forcefully that uh, that he would countenance leaving without a deal. Um, the question is, uh, you know, is he being serious? And also, will Parliament let him? Because uh, the government's majority in the House of Commons is wafer thin. A number of Conservative MPs have suggested that they would do whatever it takes to prevent us leaving without a deal, even if that includes um, voting against the government in a, what would be called a confidence motion, which would basically 
be an invitation to dissolve parliament and have an election. Wow, very interesting times there in the UK. Something for us to continue to watch. Extremely volatile, yeah. yeah. Yes, and uh, I'm sure you obviously care deeply about this. You have a family there, your career's there. And so uh, we will yeah. follow up maybe with a later show when, when things do become clear, what, what has happened with Brexit. Yes, you, you'll, you'll reach me in the sort of post-Brexit apocalypse. You know, I'll be eating out <laughs> of bins and <laughs> right. you know, sort of wastelands. Right, right. Now, I, I'm sure things will, won't get that bad. At least I hope that yeah. they don't. But uh, no. yeah, it, it no, is. I'm joking. It is interesting to see, though, a, a country inflict – what appears to be, you know, policies, choices that are going to lower the trend real growth rate moving forward. Now, I understand the concerns that you, you mentioned, some people who lived in, outside London who did not have the opportunities. Maybe they're left behind by globalization. I understand that those are issues that need to be dealt with. But effectively, Brexit is going to lower the trend real growth rate for the UK moving forward. So it's, it's a very fascinating story to, to see a country inflict this pain upon itself yeah i mean it's it's frustrating i mean i, I i'll be quite open you know I, I don't think brexit's a good idea um you know it's frustrating for me as someone who would you know like to find a way to ha- you know to deal with these issues that, because i don't think brexit will actually make dealing with those issues any easier in fact in most ways it'll make it harder as you say it'll probably reduce the growth rate it'll provide less government revenue to um you know to um come up with programs of you know ed- Education or investments or their infrastructure, which might actually um, help people deal with these these problems. Um, you know, I, I, I think, especially post financial crisis, you know, this is an issue which doesn't just affect the UK; it, it shows up in lots of countries. Um, you know, economic growth has has disappointed. Um, perhaps people's faith in institutions has been diminished, and uh, you know, the, I, I, I think. As, as economists, you know, we've sort of failed to come up with, a, with uh, um, you know, a message uh, that uh, can resonate with, with, with people and simply saying, oh, there'll be less growth. Um, you know, it doesn't hold water for people who don't feel like they're benefiting from the economy as it is or perhaps feel like economists, you know, missed um, all the warning signs pre-2008. And so can their, um, you know, can their judgment be trusted this time around? You know, polit- politicians in the UK – um, said, you know, the people were sick of experts and, um, you know, around the Brexit campaign. And, you know, I, I think although he was sort of denigrated for that comment, and in a lot of ways it is kind of awful comment, but uh, in other ways, you know, you can sort of see what he's getting at, right? I think people are a little bit sick of, uh, of self-appointed experts telling them how things are going to be, uh, you know, when they feel disconnected from, um, from uh you know, from from the description of reality that these experts come up with, you know, they don't feel like the economy is delivering for them. Yes, fair enough. Well, some of the same forces that have driven Brexit, globalization, some of the you know people being left behind, the uneven um, benefits from globalization, can also be traced to development. I want to move to next and, and discuss with you, and this this is the phenomenon of these really low interest rates we're seeing all around the world. So so. Part of what mm-hmm. we're seeing is a consequence of globalization, particularly financial globalization, opening up you know, global capital markets. So uh, credit flows across borders effortlessly. And I believe the latest numbers show approximately $13 trillion in uh, public debt globally now trade at negative yields, negative interest rates. So That's people right. are paying their governments to take the money and then give it back to them. I believe even France, you know, with all its issues, recently touched on negative yields. Germany has been negative. Switzerland has mm-hmm. been very negative. Um, even here in the U.S., you know, our 10-year Treasury yields bouncing around 2%, which is really low. And if you think in terms of kind of inflation adjusted, it's pretty close to zero in real terms itself. So there's this huge sea of, of really low-yielding um, government debt out there. Now, this is for safer places, typically. I know some places, though, surprisingly, like even Italy <laughs> has seen their, their, their government bond yields drop as well. But this is part of what I, yes, I would call the same safe asset shortage. There's this, this growing mm-hmm. appetite for government debt. Uh, 
people are effectively you know standing at the at the door of the treasuries, the finance ministries. They're knocking, hey, give us more, which is a hard story to to to, to sell to explain to people. You know, here in the U.S. at least, we still still hear people complain about the size of our public debt, um, and it's often something that politicians will bring up in one breath. And at the same time, we see yields continually staying low. I mean, you know, under President Trump. Um, the the national debt has grown dramatically, and yet we have ten year treasury yields at historic lows, which again is a signal that the demand for this these treasuries are, are really elevated. And now we've written about this, and we'll get to this in a minute. But just generally speaking, what is your take on this? What what do you see going on, and, and does it really matter? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think it's an absolutely first order issue in terms of. Um, both, you know, financial markets uh, and the broader economy and sort of policy environment. And as you say, um, you know, remarkably low interest rates, um, significant amounts of uh, governments issuing debt, even out at 10 year, 10 year points or beyond uh, negative rates. Um, you know, bond yields, um, I, I think today minus 26 uh, basis points, the 10 year points. Uh, even as you said, even French uh, OATs um, marginally negative as well. Um, so, you know, really remarkably low yields, even for countries um, with pretty high elevated debt ratios compared to um, pre-crisis, you know, um, you know, before the crisis uh, in Europe, there was a, you know, a sense that the debt to GDP ratios would be maintained at sort of 60 percent or below um, post-crisis. And, you know, many of these debt ratios blew out, you know, in Italy are currently running about 130 percent of GDP. Um, you know, elevated levels, as you say, even in, even in the U.S. Uh, with current um, high levels of uh, high, high deficits translating into renewed increase in, in debt. And yet yields at remarkably low levels, which I think tells you that there is this sort of strong demand for, um, for safety, for, um, you know, for relatively safe assets. People um, are not looking for return on capital. They're looking for return of capital. They want to make sure they get their 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 money back and even even if you want to take a little bit off them for the privilege you know um and you know i i've i've done a little bit of uh, of work on this with you but also you know subsequently uh you know safe assets uh, are in limited supply i mean my estimate um is you know and obviously you know people have different definitions of uh, of what constitutes a safe asset but um Looking across the the range of both uh, government paper and uh, other highly rated um, fixed income assets, I would estimate that we're looking at about sixty five trillion dollars of safe assets globally, of which government bonds are maybe a little bit over forty trillion. Um, you know, that's relative to a world GDP of eighty trillion dollars. So um, it's not a huge amount, really, in terms of people's demand for this stuff. And uh, you know, some of that demand is eaten up by governments themselves, either directly um, through uh, central bank purchases. You know, QE uh, by um, major central banks has taken about $11 trillion of those safe assets off the table for the use by, by the private sector. Um, emerging market economies primarily um, hold significant amounts in international reserves. That's about another $8 trillion. Um, and then under, you know, uh, under finan- international financial rules, uh, banks and other uh, institutions required to hold a certain amount of um, their uh, assets in high quality liquid asset form. Um, uh, some of that is met through bank reserves, which have expanded through uh, these asset purchases, uh, asset purchase programs. But even taking that into account, you know, these uh, these financial uh, rules requiring um, uh, financial institutions to hold these liquid assets has also uh, you know, added to, added to the demand. Um, so as a result, you know, around about a third of total um, safe assets which are out there are being used for this, um, these kind of official uh, purposes, which obviously leaves less available for the private sector. And, you know, if you, if you just look at um, how the sort of net uh, supply of safe assets has evolved over time, um, you know, that has um, gone down in recent years uh, relative to global GDP, you know, uh, it peaked at about um, 70% of global GDP around about 2009, 2010. Um, and it's currently running about 45% of global GDP. So, you know, as demand has increased uh, with growth uh, of the global economy, 
um, the net supply of those safe assets has not uh, has not kept up. Partly that was related to sort of austerity um, policies after the financial crisis, which meant that governments, you know, at that point at least, were not issuing paper uh, to the same degree. Um, then you had QE policies, which obviously reduced the net supply available to the private sector, and some of these post-crisis uh, policies aimed at securing the financial sector, which meant that uh, some of the assets had to be held within the uh, financial system of advanced economies. Um, uh, and uh, so, you know, I, th- I think there's been a certain amount of, you know, inadequate supply of, of these assets. And as a result, that's put sort of fairly relentless downwards pressure on, on yields. You know, if you to draw a chart of, say, the term premium um, uh, on uh, 10 year U.S. Treasuries against uh, that net supply, they're pretty well correlated, actually. Um, the pattern and the two match up quite well. And uh, it does suggest that the um, term premium will remain low in, in um, subsequent years, you know, as uh, net supply of safe assets will prob- probably be more or less flat um, in an, over the next few years, which is an improvement actually on where it's been up to now, where it's been on a downwards trajectory. But because, um, y- you know, for the time being, at least central banks um, are no longer buying um, significant quantities of assets under asset purchase under their asset purchase programs. Um, because there's been a little bit of an easing up on fiscal policy, um, you know, the subnet uh, supply of those assets is sort of holding up relative to global GDP. But I think, the, you know, the underlying issue and the kind of main driver of this imbalance between supply and demand is really the fact that the economies which are capable or are judged capable of producing safe assets are not growing as fast as the economies um you know which are not and so you have growth in you know in emerging markets consistently running ahead of growth in advanced economies but um advanced economies are not able to issue enough of this paper because their economies are not are not growing and if you know if they would continue to issue uh paper in enough quantities to meet the demand from emerging markets then it would require their debt ratios to kind of explode and we saw what happened uh you know when when that happened uh, in 2008 yeah, that's that's very interesting. Now, you mentioned the number for, for your measure, your net supply of is it global safe assets went from seventy roughly seventy yeah. percent to four, mid forties. That's pretty staggering, yeah. and and that kind of again, just knowing that I think is an important fact because you know you ask many, if not most, politicians here in the U.S. They would, they would have no sense of that. I mean, I didn't, I didn't yeah. realize that these numbers that you've calculated, 70 to 45%. So the net supply of global safe assets has been declining. Now, you said the good news is it's going to flatline, which is great. Um, but, but the point is it probably should be going up a little bit. And what, what's interesting. So is you have that issue. You kind of you know, put that, that point to the side is that this problem may create it, its own, um, future problem in the following sense. It pushes rates really low, and then what's going to happen next time we have a recession? Well, central banks are going to revert to QE, is my guess, because rates are low. So, you know, typically the U.S. central bank, the Federal Reserve, typically cuts interest rates about 500 basis points or five percentage points. We're about half that right now in terms of where the short-term rate actually is, and they're probably going to lower it, which means the Fed doesn't have a lot of ammunition. So, it's going to quickly resort to QE, and I I suspect other places in the will as well because there's not a lot of room for cutting interest rates which means more of that supply of safe assets is going to be pulled onto central bank balance sheets further reducing the net supply so this this problem is is almost self perpetuating you create a low interest rate environment moreover that low interest rate environment increases you know money demand broadly defined so demand for highly liquid safe assets increases it, it kind of self perpetuates given the policy mm-hmm. response to that um yeah so, so uh, this is very problematic and and i i guess what is a solution do you do you have a solution or a, a, a way to get us out of this hole i think it's i think it's very difficult and I, and I before before i try and think of a solution um i mean i'd mention one other channel as well which i think we discussed uh, in the paper that we we worked on together which uh you know is that uh you know easing by uh b- you know by global central banks qe and other policies um, also creates looser monetary conditions globally, which then 
um, uh, you know, in, in encourages capital uh, capital flows to emerging markets, which then leads them to try and offset the impact on their currencies by accumulating reserves, which is another channel right. by which safe <laughs> assets are used up. So there's all kinds of channels, right, which, by which this kind of vicious circle, um, you know, is created. And, and you know, it's it, it it's a process which is a, which you know which has different names. You know, some people call it secular stagnation. Um, some people talk about safe asset safe asset shortage. Uh, some people talk about a global savings glut. You know, I think in a way they're all they're all similar symptoms, which is of uh, as I say, an economy, global economy, where um, the parts of the world which demand safe assets are growing faster than the parts which supply it, and also in a, a, um, a world where um, you know things like demographics and an aging population are creating greater demand for these um, for these kinds of assets. Um, and so I think it is a kind of uh, self perpetuating kind of cycle which is difficult to break out of people have come up with a number of um, you know potential ways out perhaps to um, you know for instance try and target a higher level of inflation in order to um, at least you know if you can't affect the, the uh, low real yields you can affect uh, the rate of nominal yields which potentially buys you a bit more space to cut rates before you get to a sort of lower bound. Um, people have come up with policies like, um, you know, negative interest rates, trying to change, make changes to the financial system to make it easier to push rates further into negative territory. You know, I know in the US right now, it's kind of impossible to imagine the Fed adopting a negative interest rate policy, but there are people advocating for some changes to the financial system to make that easier. You know, other parts of the world obviously have gone for negative rates. Um, you know, I, I think all these policies have uh, negative side effects, and so yep. it's not clear. It's not clear that they should be that these are policies which should be followed. I mean, apart from anything else, you know, you say you want central banks to target higher levels of inflation, they actually seem to be struggling to create any inflation at all, right? You know, even to hit their relatively low right. inflation targets right now. And so, you know, I, to be honest, I don't, I, I haven't really, um, you know, I'm not sure what the way out is. Well, I'll, I'll give you my radical solution, but let me let me kind of lead up to that by making some observations. So, so first, I think this problem speaks to what's called the Triffin Dilemma, which I believe is in the 1960s. The, the economist Triffin, last name was Triffin, he um, he outlined this issue that the main reserve currency producer of the world is going to have a demand for its assets that's greater than is needed domestically. And and I think he was talking about you know, money or currency back then, but this is true for the safe asset story as well. That the U.S. you know the world wants more U.S. debt. I mean, one way to solve this problem is to create more U.S. debt. And mm -hmm. if, if you think of it in terms of just in U.S. debt, it sounds awful. But when you think of it in terms of this Triffin dilemma, we're providing a much the U.S. government is providing a much needed financial asset to the world, which would ease this strain, which would raise. Um, interest rates, I, th I think you can view it in a different light. Now, there is a limit to this. We don't I want to be clear. Uh, the U.S. could issue so much you know, debt that it wouldn't be a risk-free asset anymore. But this kind of going back to the, the paper we wrote together, Banker to the World, the U.S. is effectively a banker to the world. And, you know, if you look at the consolidated balance sheet of the entire U.S. economy, so you got to take the public sector, the private sector, put them together, and you look at the various sides of the balance sheet, it looks a lot like a bank. So on the liability side of the consolidated U.S. economy, it tends to be weighted more towards short-term liquid assets. And th these are the liabilities to the rest of the world. So the world, they come to us, they want our treasury bills, they want commercial paper, they want deposit accounts. They want those very safe assets that can be easily turned into purchasing power. And if you look on the asset side, we tend to have riskier assets, not, not not entirely, but weighted more towards riskier. So we're going out into the world investing in assets that have a higher return. And, and so we're providing this service to the world. And I guess one solution is we need to do more banking to the world. And you know, how do you do that? I mean, really radical proposals. Would be, one would be setting up a sovereign wealth fund where the you know, U.S. treasuries are are issued to fund it. And again, this wouldn't be so much to help the U.S. domestic economy because there were talks about a sovereign wealth fund during you know the crisis, setting something up in the U.S. But I, I think there's a more of a global demand dimension to this this story. Now, I, I don't think this will ever see the light of day, but it is one potential solution. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, if you have a supply and a demand imbalance, you have to either reduce the demand or, or increase the supply, right? So. Um, the, the, I guess the problem is though that you know efforts to increase supply can create problems. You know, countries can print too much government debt and get into yep. difficulties. Um, uh, you know, you can see that clearly in in, in Europe. 
with some some economies. Um, you know, the private sector has at different times tried to create safe assets and has run into problems. You know, with the, the, the famous um, you, you know uh, uh, CDOs and uh, CDO squared and all that kind of stuff during you know in the run up to the financial crisis and. You know, part of the reason why the supply of um, safe assets went down was simply because people figured out that actually some of these assets weren't as nearly as safe as they as they were meant to be, um, which you know suggests that actually uh, it's much easier for governments to produce this stuff than uh, than, than than for the private sector. Um, you know, so I, you know, there are ways of of increasing the supply, but I think uh, it's challenging. There is no easy solution. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there is no easy way out. Every 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 solution is going to have some kind of cost. So, all right, we are running low on time, but I, I want to ask you about your research. You've published in some really top journals on the issue of central bank independence. Um, quickly summarize your findings, and then maybe tie that into recent events such as President Trump chipping away at the Fed's independence. Yeah, sure. So this was research work, which I, I um, did with Ellen Mead, who's currently at the Fed. Um, we took a look at uh, cent- issues around central bank independence, central bank transparency, um, kind of measuring how these things had changed over the over time and what potential impact it, it had had. Um, you know, as perhaps one might expect, uh, we found that central bank independence increased quite dramatically, at least in sort of in um, de jure terms um, between sort of the 1980s and sort of late 1990s, early 2000s. Um, you know, this occurred through a number of channels, uh, the creation of the European Central Bank and uh, changes to um, legislation governing how central banks worked in Europe was a big part of that. Also, obviously, the spread of kind of new central banking institutions in um, transition economies in Eastern Europe uh, played a big role. There was a lot of technical assistance from people like the IMF sort of drawing up model legislation for these institutions. So that's kind of the good news. You know, we generally think central bank independence is kind of a good thing. It produces better outcomes um, for monetary policy, uh, and there seems to be more of it. Um, when you actually look at the numbers sort of demonstrating that central bank independence leads to lower inflation, which is sort of the received wisdom, and I think partly re- reflects kind of experience of the 1970s, where countries like Germany and the US with relatively independent central banks did a better job of avoiding the high inflation that followed the oil crisis than other economies. Um, but when you actually you know, do sort of serious empirical work on this, it's not that easy to demonstrate um, a, a, a robust relationship between central bank independence and inflation um, because inflation kind of came down um, a lot kind of everywhere. And in some, it came down a lot in some countries where they made central banks more independent. But it also came down in countries which already had relatively independent central banks. And so demonstrating a kind of causal relationship there is, is difficult. Central banks also became more transparent, and um, you know the ways that central banks communicate has have um, become so much more complex. Um, you know, it, it, it's almost impossible to 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 imagine this. But in the ni- early nineteen, you know, until the early nineteen nineties, the Fed didn't even tell people when they changed the interest rate. Yes. Um, you know, now the Fed t- t- uh, can't stop talking, right? You know, you, you almost want to tell them to, to be quiet sometimes because right. there's so much. There's so much communication, not just by the Fed, by all central banks. You know, people are always talking, and the market has a sort of love-hate relationship with central bank communications. I think they, you know, they're, they're, there's always an appetite to hear from central bankers, but then, you know, when you start getting conflicting messages from different people at the Fed or at the Bank of England or the ECB, then people start to say, well, they're communicating too much. You know, they're they're, they're confusing us. They're, there's there's too much information. Um, and so I think it is a it, it is a difficult challenge for central banks to know how much to communicate. Um, you know, there's always uh, you know, the sort of current controversy in central bank transparency and communications is, you know, whether a central bank should publish a path for interest rates. Um, you know, the Bank of England, for instance, has sort of been pretty adamant uh, for, for a while that they don't want to do that. Um, you know, the, the, same, the Bank of England used to um, be very reluctant, actually, to, to, to communicate um, uh, in uh, with, with markets in on anything but their own terms. I'll give you an example of that. Um, you know, the Bank of England was quite an early adopter of, of fan charts showing forecasts for inflation, which is kind of a good thing um, in terms of aiding transparency. But they wouldn't publish the numerical parameters of those forecasts because they didn't want people to focus on the central estimate for inflation. They wanted to emphasize the uncertainty. 
um, by producing the fan charts. And so what that meant was that financial market participants would get print the inflation report out on a piece of paper, take a ruler and try and figure out what the um, central path for inflation was. And so they, you know, in other words, the, the Bank of England did tell us the path. It's just that we had to sort of estimate it with an error, um, which was probably suboptimal. Luckily, they now publish the, the numbers, um, which so we can figure it out um, a bit more cleanly. But they won't publish a forward path for, for, for interest rates, um, even though a lot of central banks do. Um, you know, the Fed obviously has the famous dot plot. They won't publish a central path, but they'll publish a range of, of numbers um, reflecting the different views of different people on the FOMC. I think at different points, the Fed has found that a useful communication tool, but at other times has found it not so useful. Um, because I think, you know, the problem with the dots is that they, they don't allow for a kind of central view. They don't allow the kind of core of the FOMC, you know, the, the Fed chair. Um, and, and other people close to, to the Fed chair to kind of provide a kind of central view of what they expect in terms of rates. Um, and so, you know, there are these uh, outstanding issues uh, in terms of transparency practices and even, in, you know, central bank independence, um, you know, as, as you hinted at, is coming uh, under fire and um, being questioned. And I think partly that reflects the experience of the financial crisis, you know, where uh, central banks were seen in some cases to have not done a good job in terms of um, anticipating risks or responding quickly enough um, once those risks crystallized. Also, the policy response, you know, things like QE has required um, a degree of sort of coordination between central banks and government, which um, was not necessary while central banks were simply setting the interest rates. And that sort of sort of renewal of that relationship between central banks and uh, the, the uh, government authorities is, I think, you, you know, created opportunities uh, for uh, governments to start wanting to interfere more in what central banks do. And clearly, you know, the latest uh, uh, you know, episodes in the US with um, the President Trump putting pressure on the Fed to cut rates has just, uh, you know, exacerbated those those tensions, I think, um, and created real problems for the Fed because, you know, now they're in a situation where, you know, even if they wanted to cut rates, which I think they do, they run the risk then of, of being accused of simply caving to political pressure. Yep. So it is a complicated world out there for central bank independence. Yeah. I actually read, I read an interesting paper just, um, just today, actually, on um, measuring political pressure on central banks. Um, it's by someone who I don't know called Professor Carola Concis Binder, which is very interesting. Um, sort of using a kind of narrative approach, looking at, um, at analysts' accounts of uh, pressure on central banks to um, usually to cut rates most of the time. Um, finding that um, uh, the central banks succumb to that pressure about 40% of the time. And actually, they seem to be succumbing to the pressure more often now than they had in the past. And so, you know, I do think this is an issue which is going to just keep growing um, and become, you know, an increasing issue for central banks. Okay, well, our time is up. Our guest today has been Chris Crow. Chris, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.